Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 56, Skylab 2, Part 2, Saving Skylab. Last time, Pete Conrad, Joe Kerwin, Paul Weitz, and half the people at NASA scrambled to figure out a way to save Skylab, America's first space station. The massive spacecraft had arrived on orbit, short one meteoroid shield and one solar array. The situation soon blossomed into a full-blown crisis as mission controllers struggled to find an orientation for the orbital outpost that would provide sufficient sunlight for the remaining solar panels without roasting the workshop in the raw heat of the sun. Over the course of 11 intense days, engineers came together in what amounted to one of the world's most impressive hackathons. Everything from spray paint to window shades to balloons and umbrellas were discussed, prototyped, and tested. In the end, several solutions made the cut. The crew trained with them and then launched atop a Saturn 1B rocket to chase down their new home. The crew arrived with no difficulty, performed a hair-raising stand-up EVA to try to yank open a stuck solar array, gave up, and moved in to dock. The finicky Apollo docking mechanism made life difficult once again, and it took several attempts, a depressurization, and some quick mechanical surgery to finally get the command module docked with Skylab. Thus ended the first of 28 days in space for the crew of Skylab 2. The next morning, the crew awoke from their first night in space and prepared to enter Skylab. The docking system consisted of an interior hatch, the docking probe, and then a second hatch that would open into Skylab itself. Once the probe was removed, the crew pulled a small volume of Skylab's air through the hatch into a sampling tube. They had always planned on checking for high levels of carbon monoxide just in case, but now they were also looking for certain toxic chemicals that could have been outgassed by the hotter-than-expected workshop insulation. To everyone's relief, the test came back negative, and the crew was cleared to finally head inside. The hatch opened into the multiple docking adapter, which was small compared to the orbital workshop, but still had several times more volume than the command module. Right away, the crew started activating systems. The Apollo telescope mount was started, and subsystems of the orbital workshop were enabled, including ventilation. One small item I was delighted to note, it seems that an unintentional tradition remained alive for Skylab, because upon first entering the MDA, the crew found a few floating screws and nuts. Building spaceships is hard. In the early afternoon, Paul Weitz became the first astronaut to enter the orbital workshop while, you know, in orbit. He basically just hopped in, took a quick look around at some basic systems, and hopped back out, all while wearing a special mask just in case some of those toxic gases were still lurking around. Inside, he found an environment that certainly wasn't comfortable, but also wasn't prohibitively hostile. That meant that the next task could begin. Deployment of the Parasol. I know I sometimes repeat things a few times on this show, but I also know that people often listen to these things on the go where it's easy to miss details. So here's a super fast recap of what the Parasol is all about. The Meteoroid Shield was a structure designed to pop out a few inches from Skylab and protect it from orbital debris. It was also painted in a specific way to keep the workshop from getting too hot. With it gone, Skylab's interior had heated up to around 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or 53 degrees Celsius. A few solutions were put together to deal with this, but the one that came to be preferred was called the parasol. It was essentially a big giant nylon umbrella with a shiny mylar layer. It was the preferred solution because it could be deployed from inside Skylab, sparing the crew from tackling a complicated spacewalk on their first few days in orbit. Now that they knew the temperature in the orbital workshop was tolerable and the air was breathable, it was time to get to work. Pete Conrad and Paul Weitz would be responsible for the parasol deployment, while Joe Kerwin stayed in the MDA to continue activating systems. He also mounted a TV camera in the window of the command module so Houston could get a glimpse of the parasol deployment in action. The deployment process was simple enough. Skylab had two small airlocks designed for use by scientific experiments. Luckily for everyone involved, one of these airlocks was almost exactly where a thermal shield needed to be. Conrad and Weitz took the big metal box containing the parasol and stuck it into the sun-facing scientific airlock. Then, over the course of the next few hours, they slowly added several extender rods to the base of the parasol, pushing it further and further out into space. It took a while because you never want to rush an operation like this, 
but also they had to retreat back to the MDA every once in a while for cool-down breaks. The temperature was tolerable, but you didn't want to overdo it. With each new extension rod, the four poles of the parasol extended out a little further and locked in place. Once the seventh rod was in place, the crew allowed the four poles to flap down, unfurling the large fabric structure. After that, they reeled the extension rods back in, removing them as they went. After four hours, the result was a big, shiny square nestled up against the now slightly toasted exterior of the orbital workshop. After spending 12 days exposed to the unforgiving and unfiltered sun, Skylab finally had a thermal shield again. Before heading to bed, Houston gave the crew a heads up that they would be moving Skylab from the compromise attitude used for the previous two weeks to the operational attitude. The compromise attitude was chosen as the best available option to keep the batteries charged, but not cook the orbital workshop. The operational attitude would point all the solar arrays directly at the sun, in a mode you'll hear me interchangeably call solar inertial mode or sun point mode. An hour and a half later, the crew called down to check in on the progress since they clearly weren't pointed in the right direction yet. Whether it was fallout from the overheated rate gyros or just the usual early mission gremlins, Houston was having a little trouble getting pointed in the right direction. But once again, the crew demonstrated how handy it can be to have an actual human on board to help diagnose issues. They not only helped Houston finally settle on the correct attitude, but developed a super-duper high-tech next-generation Sunpoint attitude sensor. They found a spot on the wall where the sun was shining and surrounded it with duct tape. If the sun was in the duct tape fence, then they knew they were at the right attitude. I asked one of the attitude control experts at work what he thought of this, and he laughed and said, that's a pretty coarse sensor, but I suppose it works. When the parasol had been deployed, the additional thermal shielding didn't make an immediate impact. It takes time to radiate away heat, after all. But when the crew returned to the orbital workshop the next day, it was apparent that things were improving. Rather than the 130 degree broil of the previous day, it was a merely uncomfortable 96 degrees. That was especially impressive when you consider that by that time, the spacecraft was back to its proper orientation, basking in the sun. The next few days were spent essentially just moving in. One thing that always strikes me about spaceflight is you've got all this incredible technology, super highly trained experts, and an incredibly expensive operation, but you still just have to spend a ton of time moving stuff around. It makes sense, but it still makes me laugh. Anyway, the crew spent much of their time unstowing equipment, setting up workstations, moving gear around, and generally making their new orbital habitat habitable. It was during this period that the first signs of a problem that would eventually be a serious strain on the relationship between the ground and the crew started to emerge. There was no problem yet, but in retrospect, it was an indicator of problems to come on future missions. Basically, the crew was really, really busy, and Houston was annoying them. With so much to do, the crew was working as hard as they could, but they were having trouble keeping up. Tasks were budgeted for a specific number of minutes and were taking far longer than expected. You'd think NASA would have learned their lesson with this by now, but they seem to have once again forgotten that it takes a while to get used to doing things in zero gravity, even for spaceflight vets like Pete Conrad. Given all that happened, it was completely understandable that the crew were behind schedule, but this low-level background tension would be a problem for all three missions. As the astronauts got to work, one thing to keep in mind is that while the thermal problem had been largely solved, or at least kicked down the road for a while, the power problem still loomed large. The backup crew and engineers on the ground were developing procedures for a potential EVA to free the stuck solar array. But for now, the crew were on a strict power budget. As few lights as possible were kept on, and crew members were strongly encouraged to turn stuff off when not in use. So not only did the crew have to deal with 40 degree shifts in temperature as they moved from the orbital workshop to the airlock module and MDA, but they were also living in a sort of dim, gloomy place. It was also quiet. That's because at only 5 PSI, the atmosphere was only about a third as thick as what you're used to at sea level. That made sound propagate pretty weakly, leading to a surprisingly quiet spacecraft. But this also made communicating, aka shouting, between modules difficult. So a bunch of intercoms were installed at various workstations around the spacecraft. It also meant that the crew could each listen to their own music on their own tape players 
without making a cacophonous racket, so that's pretty neat. And that thin air was actually just that. Air. Well, pretty close. Rather than the typical mix on Earth of 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and some trace gases thrown in, it was about 80% oxygen and 20% nitrogen. That's because this was NASA's first spacecraft with a mixed gas atmosphere. Up until this point, all piloted missions had used a pure oxygen environment. After the Apollo 1 fire, they switched to a mixed gas environment while still on the launch pad, but as the vehicle ascended and the onboard air was allowed to bleed out as they lowered the cabin pressure, it was replaced with pure oxygen. Pure oxygen is nice, because as long as you can properly handle the fire risk, it's a lot easier to deal with. There's no need to detect partial pressures of different gases and build a feedback mechanism to keep the proper mix. There was also no risk of accidentally flooding the spacecraft with nothing but nitrogen and suffocating the crew. But pure oxygen also wasn't great for the body in the long term. Up until now, that was no big deal, since the longest mission was just shy of 14 days, and most were considerably shorter than that. But Skylab missions were going to start out at 28 days, and hopefully get even longer. So mixed gas was the only way to go. Maybe all this talk of temperature swings, dim light, and muffled sound is painting an unnecessarily bleak picture. The crew were certainly in good spirits. I have to imagine that they were mostly just delighted that the mission was happening at all, after everything that had gone wrong. It also helped that by the fourth day of the mission, the temperature had cooled down enough, only 80 degrees, that the three men were able to stop sleeping in the MDA and move into their own crew quarters at the base of the workshop. Even with the low level of available electricity, the crew were able to start making progress on their science goals, especially when it came to studies of their own bodies. It doesn't take much electricity to draw blood, for instance. One thing that did impact the available electricity, however, was the Earth Resources Experiment Package, or EREP. As you'll recall, this was a suite of instruments designed to study the Earth. Maybe this isn't a revelation, but it reminds me a lot of the Earth Observing System satellites that NASA runs today, but a little more primitive and manual. Anyway, what made running the EREP a little tricky under these conditions was that in order to use it, Skylab had to be pointed towards the Earth. That doesn't happen automatically in space. In fact, Skylab was in sunpoint mode, so the side facing the Earth was constantly changing. It obviously doesn't actually work this way, but from Skylab's perspective, the Earth revolved around it every hour and a half or so. Earth's point mode is no big deal normally, but basically what happened was after finishing their EREP run, they didn't get back to sun point mode in time. So Skylab didn't get as much exposure to the sun as expected, power dropped, and some batteries took themselves offline. This spooked mission control pretty good, so EREP was mostly off the table until the solar array fix could be attempted. Some of you may have noted just how important these potential solar array repairs seemed to be and may have wondered what the plan was if they couldn't get it done. Well, I'm glad you asked. While none of them saw the light of day, since, spoiler alert, the Skylab 2 crew did fix the solar array, a couple of different solutions were in the works that I thought were pretty interesting. One was a roll-up solar array that could be stuck to the side of the workshop and hooked into the power system. Another was to take the docking module from the upcoming Apollo Soyuz test project and put some solar arrays on that. That way the next crew could dock with the module, dock that with the MDA on Skylab, and have an extra set of solar arrays sticking out of the module. It never happened, but the idea of the ASTP docking module getting use on Skylab is a pretty neat historical what-if. By June 5th, coming up on halfway through the mission, the plan for the EVA had been worked out by the backup crew and sent up to the prime crew to inspect. They even did a practice run inside the voluminous orbital workshop the next day. The plan was certainly unorthodox, but it seemed doable. All that was left was to do it. On June 7th, the crew was ready. Paul Weitz moved into the MDA just to be safe. That way, if the airlock module had trouble repressurizing, he wouldn't be trapped in the orbital workshop. Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin donned their spacesuits, hooked in their umbilicals, and depressurized the airlock module. The plan is one of those plans that sounds pretty simple in principle, but actually doing it is less simple. 
boiled down to the fundamentals, the plan was to go outside, assemble a 25-foot-long pole with some scissors on the end, get the scissors over the strap that held the solar ray in place, and cut it. Easy, right? Well, we'll see. The two men emerged and got to work assembling the long pole with the cutting tool on the end. So far, so good. Next, they made their way over to some structural elements that were about as close to the solar array as possible, which wasn't really all that close. Remember, no EVAs were planned for the area of the spacecraft that needed work, so there were no handholds and no footholds. In fact, even the area the astronauts were in wasn't really designed with EVAs in mind. As such, while the crew could grab the structural elements without much trouble, they found foot placement to be problematic. As Kerwin extended the pole out towards the stuck solar array, he found it extremely difficult to remain stable. Rusty Schweikart, the Skylab 2 backup commander, was on Capcom and tried to help with some advice from the simulated runs in the pool. Reading about Kerwin's struggles brought me all the way back to 1966 and the flight of Gemini 9A. Gene Cernan had been tasked with performing what could be called the first useful EVA. Ed White had proven the concept on Gemini 4, but it basically just had a fun time floating around in space. When Cernan tried to actually get things done, he discovered that it was incredibly difficult and tiring. With nothing to hook his hands or feet into, everything he did resulted in an equal and opposite reaction, and he found himself struggling to perform even basic movements. Nine years later, and here we are again. Come to think of it, Gemini 9A also had issues with an unwelcome metal strap. At least Skylab didn't have any angry alligators to deal with. Looking around at his environment, Kerwin had a clever idea. He looped one of the spare tethers around a piece of structure and threw a connection on his chest, pulled tight, and sort of stood up on the side of the spacecraft, straining against the tether. Just like that, he found his footing. Using his newfound stability, Kerwin slipped the cutting tool over the strap and pulled the control tether to make sure it was firmly in place. Next was one of those events that makes me shake my head in awe at the early days of spaceflight. Pete Conrad grabbed onto the pole and pulled himself hand over hand down to the solar array, trailing his umbilical and a second tether rope as he went. Once down there, he could get the first close-up look at the debris that had plagued the mission and ensure that the cutter tool had been properly positioned. He also tied the tether rope to the end of the solar array cover. That'll come into play in a minute here. The crew wasn't entirely sure what would happen when the strap was cut. They had been told that the most likely outcome was that it would suddenly lurch out a few inches and then need some help getting the rest of the way. But it was possible that it would just open all the way in one go. Even with that warning, Conrad must have been pretty alarmed when at the moment Kerwin pulled on the cutter tool tether, the whole solar array cover did indeed lurch several inches outwards all at once. I think with Conrad along for the ride. Lurching complete, Conrad confirmed that the most likely outcome had indeed happened. The cover was now free, but since it had spent so long jammed up, the deployment mechanism was stuck. This is where the second tether, called the beam erection tether, came into play. Conrad made his way back down the pole, and he and Kerwin slipped between Skylab and the beam erection tether. The thought was that the solar array cover was just a little stiff, and with some encouragement would quickly open all the way. Conrad and Kerwin placed the tether over their backs, and then stood up against the side of the space station, straining to pull against the cover and the rope. All at once, it swung open, and both men tumbled off into space. But once they reeled in their tethers, they were back on structure. But with maybe a little more adrenaline in their system than before. When they looked back to the solar array cover, they saw a beautiful sight. The cover was fully deployed, and all three solar arrays inside were slowly beginning to extend towards the base of Skylab. It had worked. Oh, and if this wasn't crazy enough on its own, I left out a detail that I'll be talking about more in upcoming episodes. They did all this with constant communication gaps with Houston. When Pete Conrad was heading down the pole to No Man's Land, they were just entering an hour-long communications gap. These guys... The main task of the EVA had been accomplished, but they weren't quite done yet. Since they were already out there, Kerwin made his way to the top of the Apollo telescope mount to swap out some film. Since the ATM was actually designed with spacewalks in mind, this was a piece of cake. 
But what's kind of funny is since the ATM sticks way out to the side of Skylab, it sort of feels like you're climbing around on the top of a building. So here's Joe Kerwin, nearly 300 miles above the surface of the Earth, and he finds himself a little distressed at being so high above the rest of Skylab. Human perception is weird sometimes. After three and a half hours, both men climbed back into the airlock module, closed the door, and the EVA was over. It was an unqualified success. I guess just to remind the crew who was boss, that night Skylab threw a curveball their way. In the middle of the crew's sleep period, Houston had no choice but to wake them up. The coolant loops in the airlock module were getting so cold that they were worried they could freeze, and it couldn't wait until morning. In order to get some heat into the system, the crew took the liquid-cooled EVA undergarments, hooked them into the coolant loops, and stuck them onto some warm parts of the workshop wall where the parasol wasn't placed quite right. Then back to bed. With the thermal crisis solved and electricity mostly restored, the rest of the long mission essentially went like clockwork. The crew quickly fell into a routine, getting loads and loads of science done. As they passed the 23-day mission duration record set by the ill-fated crew of Soyuz 11, they passed along their respects to the Soviet cosmonauts. Chief Cosmonaut Vladimir Shatilov replied with a message of congratulations. With some of their precious free time, they also answered some unofficial scientific inquiries. It seems some bets in Houston had been placed about whether or not it would be possible to run along the interior circumference of the orbital workshop. The crew were happy to give it a shot. Their conclusion? No problem. If you've never seen it, you really owe it to yourself to throw Skylab running into your search engine of choice, because there are some great videos. I'm going to skip a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff, since we'll have a chance to get more in-depth over the next two missions, but the remainder of Skylab 2 essentially proceeded without a hitch. Just since I mentioned it last time, Conrad was exercising so much that he began hitting the onboard stash of butter cookies pretty hard. In fact, he specifically requested that some be waiting for him on the recovery ship when he came home. Three days before heading home, it was time for one more EVA this time with Paul White's taking the place of Joe Kerwin. Instead of the harrowing antics of the previous EVA, this was just a routine run up the ATM to swap out some data tapes. They also noted that the parasol was indeed starting to deteriorate in the harsh sun as expected. NASA actually knew this would happen, since there had been some initial thought about flying a big American flag on the side of the station, but they discovered that nylon didn't do so great in space. The parasol wasn't chosen as a permanent solution, but rather as a stopgap measure that bought everyone time. The window shade style replacement was already on board for the next crew to deploy. But just to get a head start, this crew attached some of the window shade material to the outside of Skylab. That way the next crew could inspect it and get an idea of how it handled its time outside. While out there, Houston also had a quick task for Pete Conrad. One of the batteries on the ATM had been offline for some time, but it was suspected that there was just a stuck relay inside. If Conrad could give it a quick whack with his hammer, it might fix it. Well, Conrad was more than happy to comply. White's radioed down, holy cats, and Capcom asked, how hard did you hit it? Conrad replied simply, pretty hard. But hey, it worked. <laughs> Good old percussive debugging. Despite all the difficulty docking in the first place, when the time came to head home on June 22, 1973, the hardware worked perfectly. As Conrad performed one last fly around of Skylab, the crew must have been immensely satisfied with the work they had done. They had arrived uncertain that their mission was even possible, and they were leaving a healthy spacecraft that was more than ready for its next crew. Pete Conrad actually considered his work aboard Skylab to be far more of an accomplishment than his lunar landing mission. The crew settled in for entry in just their normal flight suits, as there was concern that after 28 days in space, the combination of entry G's and the bulky pressure suits may prove too burdensome to operate the control panels. After an uneventful deorbit burn, re-entry, and splashdown, the spacecraft was retrieved and gently set down on the USS Ticonderoga, which was retrieving the Skylab 2 crew as its final mission. One of the goals of the crew was to dispel any question about the viability of long-term spaceflight. As such, they had worked their butts off on the exercise equipment on Skylab, and when the command module door opened, all three men were able to climb out and walk across the ship's deck unassisted, if a little bit shaky. <laughs> 
The second they landed, the medical examinations began. After all, half the point of this flight was to better understand the medical impact of such a long-duration stay in space. But with the medical exams and mission debriefings lasting almost as long as their time in space, I'm sure the crew were already looking forward to getting home. Skylab 2 broke all the records for spaceflight. They proved that NASA can not only operate and learn valuable lessons from a space station, but that they can improvise and accomplish the seemingly impossible. They left Skylab better than they found it, and left a station that was ready for a crew to get to work on day one. And that crew would be arriving sooner than they thought. Due to concerns about the status of the parasol, the launch was moved up almost three weeks. Usually launch schedules move the other way. But who would be commanding this second mission and following in the footsteps of Pete Conrad, the third person to walk on the moon? How about the fourth person to walk on the moon? Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.